Hello and welcome to another Ideas with Purpose webinar featuring Thinkers50 shortlisted thinkers brought to you in association with Executive Networks, our talent award partner. I'm Des Dearlove. And I'm Stuart Craner, and we're the founders of Thinkers50, the world's most reliable resource for identifying, ranking and sharing the leading management ideas of our age. At the Thinkers50 Awards Gala 2021, on November 15th and 16th, we'll be announcing the all new Thinkers 50 ranking of the world's leading management thinkers and the recipients of the Thinkers 50 Distinguished Achievement Awards. This year, the Thinkers 50 Awards Gala is completely virtual. So you can join us from anywhere in the world. All the information is on our website at thinkers50.com and it would be fantastic if you can join us. Today, we are delighted to welcome one of the shortlisted thinkers for the Strategy Award. Sangeet Paul Chowdhury. Sangeet is the founder. Sangeet is the founder of Platformation Labs and the best-selling author of multiple books, including Platform Revolution and Platform Scale. He has advised the leadership of more than 40 of the Fortune 500 firms and has been selected as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. Sangeet's work on platforms has been selected by Harvard Business Review as one of the top 10 ideas in strategy. And he's with us for 45 minutes, so please send in any questions or observations as we go along. Uh, Sangeet, uh, welcome. Uh, I, I'm always interested to get back to the foundations of uh, people's... In how, how did you get interested? What was your... What ignited your interest in platforms in, in the first place? Because you, I mean, that's what you're be best known for. Yes, th thank you, Stuart, and thank you for this opportunity to discuss... Uh, these ideas and more about my work. What really got me into platforms was uh, back at the start of the 2010s, um, the early part of the last decade, we were seeing a new uh, generation of businesses coming up. We were seeing the companies of the likes of Uber, Airbnb just getting started. We were seeing the big tech scaling up. And I felt fundamentally that there was a new logic to value creation when, when we uh, looked at these companies. To a large extent, people did not, uh, you know, there were many different narratives uh, in explaining what was changing. Some people called it an online, offline versus online shift, making it a very channel or media based analogy. Some people talked about non-intelligent versus intelligent systems. So it was more about whether data is being captured or not. But these were different threads or strands of a much larger shift. And that's what really got me excited about this, that there was an opportunity to kind of really articulate what was happening, how the logic of value creation was fundamentally changing. And uh, in, in kind of um, researching that and then condensing that into a simple message, I came up with this uh, analogy of what's really happening is this shift from pipelines where traditional industrial models were built around a linear flow of value and uh, were built around technologies of mass production and mass consumption and uh, and technology of connecting the two global supply chains and container shipping. And what was really changing now was a new set of technologies were enabling a new form of business model, the platform business model. And the, the key technologies that were driving this was an increase in connectivity because of, um, you know, especially 2007 on was the rise of mobile computing. Uh, also the rise of the cloud as, as a way to um, uh, unbundle connectivity, or, uh, unbundle usage from uh, computing. And uh, the, the rise of large systems that could process data at scale, which is what we saw largely happen over the last 10 years. We started uh, figuring out new ways to manage data at scale, use that to train systems, and then use that to manage ecosystems. So that's really what got me into it, to fundamentally explain how the you know in, in a cohesive manner what what exactly was changing in terms of how value was being created so i think the last time we caught up with you it was just sort of at the beginning of the pandemic and i i think you were in singapore at the time it feels as though a lot's changed the pandemic seems to have accelerated some of these some of these trends and and it seems to have you know um really pushed the platform concept forward is that, is that a fair appraisal yes absolutely Des. um the pandemic has certainly accelerated a lot of trends that were already underway and has actually uncovered new second order effects of some of those trends. Um, a few things that come to mind. First, 
when you think about the platform economy, it's fundamentally about understanding which part of a value chain is getting commoditized and which part of the value chain is now concentrating value in a new way. And we saw many examples of this happening with pandemic, with the pandemic. Uh, for example, one of the best examples would be what happened with uh, movie studios and how um, the the release window that movie studios, uh, the release windows that theaters had uh, as a negotiating power over movie studios, that kind of got eroded and that power shifted to streaming companies, which then used that to aggregate demand at scale, all of this demand sitting at home uh, because of the pandemic. And so there are those shifts in demand and supply side dynamics when they lead to a shift in va uh, where value is being concentrated and where where commoditization is happening those shifts start becoming permanent even if the original uh, factors that led to the shift like a lockdown uh, get reversed so we started seeing some of that happening we started seeing the rise of of what we now are increasingly calling the metaverse people spending a lot more time in virtual environments uh, we used to have virtual environments as long back as um, Cyworld in South Korea in the early 2000s or Second Life, um, which was used um, uh, in the mid 2000s. What's changed now is it's not just virtual en environments. We're creating new infrastructure for virtual environments, new financial infrastructure, new infrastructure for commerce. Uh, a lot of my recent work in uh, looking at Web3 technologies has really looked at how these new infrastructures will allow a large part of our interactions in the real world to move into virtual environments. And so these are things that second order effects that have um, that would not have been possible without the pandemic or would have taken much longer for us to get there. So it's certainly accelerated from a lot of these perspectives. And that, the, 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 the result of that is, is you know, very much, it's, it's an unequal revolution. There's winners and losers, right? It, it absolutely is. Uh, over the last two years, we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, the K-shaped recovery of the economy. It's uh, it's most visible in the platform economy, where the the players about the algorithm, the ones who are coding these platforms, uh, they've actually gained and concentrated um, wealth and value at scale, and the ones who are being orchestrated by these algorithms, whether it's the it's the driver on a ride hailing or a delivery application, or uh, whether it's uh, a freelancer on a freelancing platform, they've increasingly started seeing the policies of these platforms govern their livelihood, govern their career direction, govern what kind of agency they have in managing their work. So we've definitely seen this K-shaped recovery as the world moves on into a post-pandemic world, there's much more concentration of value above the algorithm and much more commoditization below the algorithm. Yeah, Sridhar joins us from India and, uh, and said he, he knows he knows your work. And, uh, and he said he's interested to hear more because uh, he, he thinks that platforms are running into ethical issues such as platform power inequity, AI dependency-based scaling, et cetera. Uh, is that the case? Can you can you clar clarify the ethical situation that platforms are now encountering? Absolutely. I I, I think um, five years back this was still possibly open to debate, or there were different ways to spin the story. Now it's it's the most open secret in the sense that platforms started with this whole um, promise of openness and. Um, in this promise of openness, what we really missed out with the rise of the platform economy was that while we moved towards open production, which meant that you no longer had to control the means of production in order to uh, sit in a powerful position in the value chain, you could leverage open production. We did not move into open governance. Governance is still highly centralized. And because governance is centralized, the funding of these platforms is centralized the returns that get extracted from the ecosystem are, are also increasingly centralized. And so that's what that's essentially what leads to a lot of these ethical issues. When we have scenarios where there's a conflict of interest, where Amazon as a market maker also uses the market data to become a better producer, or uh, we have scenarios where algorithms are used to um, create increasingly um, uh, polarizing content or uh, serve increasingly polarized content in a, in a bid to increase clicks on ads. These are scenarios that that happen of the centralization of governance. And because eventually we are framing the rules of the ecosystem or allowing the rules of the ecosystem to be framed by a, 
a, a small number of those who, as I mentioned, sit about the algorithm. So that is the challenge that uh, the platform economy comes with. And this is where I believe that there have been at least two attempts to move things in a new direction. One has been with re-igniting um, some of the principles of socialism in bringing more of a community platform approach, uh, platforms which can be owned by the ecosystem, by the community, uh, companies like Stocksy, where uh, the photographers who are contributing their photos to the platform also own equity on the platform. Or there's the other uh, movement with decentralized technologies, which uh, I believe are, are much more promising in terms of how well they can scale. And uh, as you know, as we move forward, as new funding mechanisms emerge to fund some of these decentralized technologies, uh, we could start seeing some of the ills of the platform economy be addressed with that. So, I mean, another fascinating thing I thought when I looked at some of your recent work was the suggestion that the uh, entire economies are becoming platforms. I mean, I'm thinking, I think you talk about China and its move towards becoming a sort of a platform economy. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Absolutely. Um, that, that's been a, a topic of, uh, of real interest and fascination for me. It's fundamentally, the idea or, or, or the way the platform economy has evolved has essentially been... Um, the the balance of or it's essentially been uh you know the management of the trade-off between openness and control the more you open your uh the more you open out your business model the more you open out how you operate you start creating new mechanisms of control now essentially this idea of being open and creating new forms of control points in the ecosystem this is what now countries are using in geopolitics so if you look at a country like china for instance a lot of its strategy around the Belt and Road uh, Initiative is to export infrastructure to other countries, use that exported infrastructure as a way to get embedded into the economic and social systems of other countries, and then use that to build out standards and create a new form of uh, 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 a new form of geopolitical coordination uh, and standardization with these countries. And I identify um, in, in uh, you know, work that I've done with Brookings on this topic, I identified four specific themes where China has been following the strategy. One has been global trade, where Alibaba today um, creates a lot of the trade infrastructure uh, for, for global trade by bringing SMEs, small and medium enterprises in target countries online through its electronic world trade platform. And then connecting those digitized SMEs and their commerce back to the hubs in China. So there's a significant volume of trade that's moving onto this new infrastructure. We're also seeing that with payments, uh, not just with China releasing and you know backing its own digital currency, but also uh, companies like Ant Financial, for instance, uh, creating new financial infrastructure where they're investing in, in wallets and banks around the world and porting them to their infrastructure. And so between trade and payments, those those are the two uh, key geopolitical uh, you know, levers based on which you can shift the reserve currency away from the U.S. dollar. And that's where um, I believe that China is using more of a platform strategy in opening out its infrastructure, getting it adopted by other countries, using that for standards based coordination and creating those control points in the form of the AI uh, that is used to um, uh, alone in Kazan, for instance, or the AI that is used to fund um, a particular trade transaction, all of that then gets centralized with, with one country. Uh, so those were two themes. There were two other themes that I looked at, uh, supply chains and where 5G becomes an important part of supply chains and smart cities and uh, social identity systems. So these are all uh, themes where China is following this three-pronged strategy of export the infrastructure, get embedded and create a control point, and then coordinate through standards. And that's where I believe countries are using platform strategy increasingly. Which I suppose begs the question: How how should other countries respond? What is if you're faced with a, a hugely successful and powerful platform? What do you need to do? Yeah, I, it's uh, it's it's interesting where we are in this whole uh, evolution and, and journey at this point. There are at least three different kinds of approaches that we are seeing with countries using platform. Uh, principles in geopolitics. So one is what I just outlined as the China model. Uh, the second is what I will broadly call the India model. And 
I, this is not necessarily one being better than the other. Um, it's more of just contrasting the two different models. The, the India model is more based on creating uh, a, uh, a set of building blocks uh, and set, you know, software building blocks and setting them as, up as digital public goods, whether it is uh, a software building block to determine uh, uh, somebody's identity or whether it's a software building block to determine uh, how uh, children are getting educated. Uh, these are the building blocks that are being built first with India Stack and then with other initiatives that are happening out of India. And one strategy is to kind of export all of this to different countries, allow them to um, leverage the building blocks that have been created to essentially build out similar systems in their countries. And this is again, something that got accelerated because of COVID. All of India's vaccination, for instance, was uh, tracked and built using these building blocks, the whole vaccination program. So that's the other model where you export infrastructure. Uh, there are ways to create control points here as well. Uh, what we what I've repeatedly seen is there is no truly pure open system. There are always ways to create control points in any system. And uh, uh, that's the second uh, approach. The third approach is what I would call the Singapore approach. Uh, I've been based in Singapore for a long time now and advise the government over there on their strategy. And uh, the Singapore-based approach is more around acknowledging that in a platform economy or in a connected digital economy, small countries will have their own play. They're not going to have huge internal markets. And so the way they will play in this economy is to use regulatory arbitrage deregulate your in, your internal market, attract uh, innovation and IP. So Sw Singapore, Switzerland, New Zealand, all these countries are following a similar template. Uh, you'll see these countries deregulating crypto, attracting a lot of crypto, um, uh, fintech, uh, attracting self-driving uh, uh, technologies. So the idea over here is that instead of uh, necessarily using your internal scale to validate the platform, you deregulate, attract IP, and then create a hub where you create the sandbox for such experimentation. And Singapore has done that very well with financial technologies, for instance, and then export that once validated at a small scale, start exporting that to other small countries, uh, get scaled through that, and then eventually go to the bigger country and uh, gain more of uh, acceptance of your infrastructure through that. So those are three different strategies that I've seen uh, of how countries are responding to this opportunity. I mean, again, we talked about some of the tensions between countries and, and, and within the sort of um, geopolitical sphere. But what about, I mean, you also talk about the tension between big tech, if you like, and big government, which, which quite often will be an internal tension. You, you know, we, we, we see it very, I think we see it at the moment going on. And in the, the first part of the of the pandemic, it felt as though, you know, the, 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 it, it, it plays into the hands of big tech. But now it feels like there might be a bit of a... Um, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a comeback by big government in terms of trying to control big tech. How do you see, I mean, is that, again, is that a reasonable um, assessment? That's a bit simplistic, I know, but um, how would you describe that? Yeah, I, I, I believe that's that that's one of those defining tensions of our time right now, because uh, a lot of these big tech companies know more about your citizens than you do as a government um, and, and are, are able to better serve your citizens or better determine for example, potential for crime or potential for, uh, uh, you know, social reputation uh, than governments could do themselves. So one part of it is the, the fact that governments do see uh, big techs as becoming more powerful. Um, the second part of it kind of came up with the, with the pandemic, where initially all governments were taken by surprise when when the pandemic hit them. They 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 were not built for that level of uh, um, you know external shock, and they, they did not have that level of resilience in their systems. And that, that's when companies like Alibaba and Amazon these were the ones whose supply chains were working. Uh, co companies like uh, again AWS, Microsoft they they set up the contact tracing. Uh, well, Google and Apple set up contact tracing infrastructure. AWS and Amazon set up a lot of the initial data pools that were used to run research uh, 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 for, for COVID. So there was a lot of um, there was a lot of evidence that came up in the early parts of the pand pandemic that you do need big tech because they've, they've, they're built for a different level of resilience and different level of scale. And uh, 
so that's been one part of the tent of of uh, you know one side of the coin uh, around this tension and even if we look at china uh, while the government is regulating alibaba while alibaba as a private com- as a as a as a you know a, as a private sector company does uh, get impacted what we also see is that alibaba is inextricably linked to china's ambitions with future geopolitics you uh, so so there's uh, so china is really a, a great example of uh, understanding this this dance between the big tech and the big government because it's not completely black and white in the sense that the government just wants to regulate big tech only for the benefit of the market somewhere it's also about ensuring that there are some reins that are put on big tech so that big tech does not get inordinately high negotiating power versus the government so it's a combination of the two um, you could argue that in europe it's a bit different the you know governments or countries are much smaller governments have different priorities and so it's more about reining in big tech but at least in the us and in india and in china i see it's about really dancing that uh, dance together managing that delicate balance where the two need to um, be in bed together but at the same time you don't want one to dominate over the other so um, that's really how i see this big tech versus big government thing playing out do, do you see any platforms which which have the moral and the uh, governance high ground? I mean, that's because virt- virtually everyone I think of has got is compromised by in in some way. But are there ever are there any that are kind of a, a force for good or or well well ethically managed? Do you think? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question because if you look at press releases from platforms, you will see. Um, them kind of, you know you will see different platforms kind of trying to play um uh, play on the story of um say again not specifically about these companies but say a company like shopify talking about how they're more about empowering the merchant versus a company like amazon which is uh, not necessarily empowering the merchant so there are uh, a, a lot of narratives like this that are spun but what i've repeatedly seen and what kind of makes me a bit disillusioned about uh, how platforms work at scale is that platforms typically, um, you know, you need the e- ecosystem to get to a certain level of scale. And when they do need the ecosystem, um, they are positioned uh, more as a force of good. And beyond that, once they reach a certain level of scale, that's where they have the ability to extract a surplus, whether in terms of just, uh, you know, a monetary surplus from the transaction or whether in terms of a data surplus uh, to inform their systems beyond the value that they give back to the user, um, they have that um, that choice at a certain level of scale. And I've repeatedly seen platforms increasingly take that choice in a way that uh, reduces the narrative of them being a force of good, uh, force for good. So we're kind of seeing the same thing happen with Web3 right now. We're seeing the same thing happen with... Um, uh, the whole move around digital public goods, but a lot of these things um, take on that narrative when they don't have the skill and when they're embracing the ecosystem. Um, and I'd love to see them continue with that narrative and not bait and switch once they reach a certain level of skill. That's not something that I've seen, um, you know, a, a, in a very compelling way yet. Uh, we've, we've got some interesting questions coming in. You know, people wanting to talk about, go back to the, some of the geopolitics, which is fascinating. But just quickly, we, we've talked about you know, the platform companies and even countries. But what, what about what about those old pipeline businesses? What about the, the you know the old incumbents? What is is there anywhere for them to go other than to transform themselves into platforms? Is there a, is there a move beyond platforms or something that that some of the older companies might might consider to um, sort of um, get back in the game absolutely i uh, this is a question that i get asked you know my my initial short answer to the question is that while every company may not become a platform every company needs to have a strategy for the platform economy because even if you don't become a platform you will have to play in value chains where platforms are setting standards they are creating infrastructures they are setting market bottlenecks so eventually you have to think about which parts of your business get commoditized in the platform economy and where do you need to move as a business going forward? And uh, the, so the first part of it is really to think about what is your strategy for the platform economy? The second part of it is to understand that building a platform is not a silver bullet. Instead of thinking about, are we a pipeline or a platform? The question that every company should be asking themselves is 
what is our source of competitive advantage today and does that get commoditized in the future do we have it today which we don't use to compete but can be used to compete in the future and so really thinking about your which value chains you will participate in which ecosystems you will participate in what would be the the key control positions in those ecosystems and what is your ability to move to such a position that's really how i would see um, you know what pipeline companies should be doing right now and there are many elements of this um, when when you think about commoditization there are a few themes that we see repeatedly happening across industries one such theme is that we repeatedly seeing uh, players that organize the primary demand of a users um, they end up commoditizing players that serve the secondary demand so let me give a few examples um if i own a car my primary demand is for vehicle care but british petroleum and shell uh, they sell motor oil i'm not waking up in the morning trying to find the best motor oil i'm trying to find how to uh, really you know take care of my car so unless the the companies that sell motor oil get in, into also owning the decisions uh, how to empower me to manage my car whether it is me managing my car myself or whether it's technicians managing the vehicle in a in a car care center unless they get into those decisions they are just getting commoditized by those who are getting into those decisions so if tomorrow there's an ai based application that can help you manage your car that can also then commoditize the decision of which motor oil to be recommended to you we see the same thing happening in banking because financial services were always secondary demand payments and loans are secondary to the primary de demand of uh, commerce and you know uh, buying a house or buying a car and so companies that own that primary demand when they start owning the decision from the user perspective when they uh, encapsulate that decision inside their recommendation system they now also have the power to recommend and hence commoditize those who are playing the secondary demand so we're seeing uh you know things like this happening so this is just one example of how to think about commoditization there are many other ways in which commoditization plays out and as a company rather than really thinking of a platform or an ecosystem as the end goal or the end solution the real question is where are we getting commoditized and what's driving that and then how do we respond to that yeah interesting i like it'd be interesting to to know sangi the the difference because there's a new language you're using around competition really um you talk about the metaverse ecosystems platforms and in particular what what's the relationship and the difference between ecosystems and platforms because the two are often used interchangeably it seems it's, it seems to me though they're not they're not the same thing no they're not absolutely um we've had ecosystems for a long time ecosystems are systems of interconnected entities i'm not even calling them businesses they're systems of interconnected entities that work together to create value so we've had ecosystems before the digital age we've had um, uh, ecosystems whether they were local in nature or uh, more expanded we've had ecosystems for quite some time now there are primarily uh, three different ways in which i see ecosystems being organized traditionally ecosystems were organized through contracts you you had loose uh, contracts between different participating parties and uh, you were able to manage relationships between those entities through contracts the problem with contracts is that contracts don't scale very well the what's happening today is the contract is getting embedded inside the api and so with apis getting opened up contracts are scaling up much better with blockchain and decentralized technologies we are now seeing smart contracts coming up so my point is that contracts as a technology were the dominant way to organize ecosystems a second dominant way to organize ecosystems especially technology based and innovation based ecosystems were standards where if you were sony you set up the cd standard or the dvd standard or you were intel and you decided that something was going to be the usb standard your ability to innovate faster than the industry allowed you to propagate that standard otherwise if if there was no single player with an innovation advantage companies came together and agreed on a standard so that's where the open versus closed standards terminology comes in but standards are also used to organize ecosystems and the third way that's really happening at scale now which is why ecosystems have become so important is essentially platforms platforms organize ecosystems much better than standards and contracts 
platforms are essentially an organizing uh, mechanism where you where, you know any platform as an organizing mechanism consists of two factors it provides an open infrastructure for parties to connect so whether it's amazon and amazon provides uh, you know an open infrastructure in terms of warehousing as a service logistics as a service e-commerce as a service to merchants um, or whether it's on the other side it provides an open infrastructure for consumers to join in and transact with these merchants so it provides a platform provides an open infrastructure for the ecosystem to connect and then uses the data of the ecosystem to govern them and improve their interactions much better and in a more scalable manner than they would have been able to organize themselves outside the platform. And so typically a platform succeeds in, in an ecosystem because it can organize the ecosystem much better than the entities can organize themselves. So that's really the relationship between a platform and an ecosystem. A platform is the most scalable and the most uh, you know scalable both in terms of scale and scope compared to contracts, compared to standards. And, and so that's why ecosystems have become much more important now than they were 40 years back, even though they existed 40 years back as well. Okay, interesting. We, I mean, take, we'll take a couple of questions now. Um, Hitesh is asking, he's tuning in from the US. He says, uh, you talked about 5G and looking at network as commodity in many countries. Can you elaborate on how 5G or network can be, pla can be pla the platform? Probably as primary demand provider. I think that kind of, talks to just what you were just talking about just now. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if I, I would say that, um, you know, 5G is an enabling technology that uh, when we're talking about platforms over here, because again, the, the term platform is uh, heavily abused um, and means different things in different contexts, depending on how people use it. We're talking about platforms as business models, uh, a, a logic of va for value creation. And so when we talk about platforms over here, I see 5G as an enabling technology for new systems to be organized around platforms. 5G, for example, can help you digitize your entire supply chain and enable multiple processes across, across your supply chain to be digitized, managed in the cloud, and hence eventually orchestrated through platforms. 5G can be used to digitize your uh, interactions around a city and essentially move away from the smart city as a way to push citizen services uh, over digital channels to a new model where uh, citizens can participate because they have 5G connectivity, they can participate and they and their assets can participate and interact with the city's assets. So I really see 5G as a new, um, you, you know, it's, it's a new technology uh, or a new generation of technology that, that's pushing who or what can be part of the platform economy, which types of interactions which were too expensive to digitize and scale in the past can now be digitized and scaled through platforms. That's what 5G is fundamentally doing. And I especially uh, uh, you know, find it valuable in digitizing supply chains, digitizing asset intensive parts of the economy, digitizing the grid for instance, uh, and then digitizing cities. So these are, these are areas where um, Prior to 5G, the cost of managing those transactions on a platform would have been too expensive. And so uh, that was not happening. And now that's happening at scale. Got a question from Miner uh, Empoyo, who's in Brussels. Um, and he asked, what, what happens to supranational institutions like the WHO or the UN or institutions like that? Are they kind of rendered redundant by the power of platforms, especially gov governmental platforms? Yeah, this is this is a really interesting question because if we follow the template of what's played out in um, in in the business world or in commerce, traditionally when you had to agree on a standard, you built standards through committee. You would set up a committee, they would agree on a standard, and you would have bodies like I, the IEEE, for instance, uh, setting up these standards and agreeing on standards, and then the industry adopting them. What happened with the platform economy? was that standards became implicit by virtue of the fact that Google is the dominant search engine. As a website owner, I use Google's SEO guidelines. So essentially, Google has created the standard in SEO without requiring that committee to agree on it, without requiring an industry body to sit uh, uh, you know, around that standard. And what Google then does is it combines its SEO guidelines with a set of tools that help me optimize my website and it provides me additional tools to get discovered on Google search. So it, it, it replaces the standard by committee with this ecosystem of an implicit standard and complementary assets that make it more valuable for me to use that standard. 
I, I believe something similar is going to happen with geopolitics because the WHO, the UN, these are standards by committee. The NATO, these are all standards by committee. It's a bunch of co countries coming together, agreeing on how they want to operate, agreeing on uh, you know certain aspects, uh, and, and then operating together and benefiting from that agreement. Whereas what's going to increasingly happen is the digital infrastructures that do get adopted, they will implicitly drive standards or they will implicitly drive new forms of agreements be between companies. So again, I would see the, the Belt and Road Project as one of those uh, things we, we should really keep a close eye on as, as a template for how future international cooperation would work. Uh, the Digital Public Goods Alliance that uh, India, Norway, and a few other countries, Japan, etc., have worked on is another such alliance that would, by virtue of the fact that the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure is being adopted across these countries, the standard becomes implicit. So that's what I believe will replace the, the global multinational bodies of today uh, with a new form of cooperation in the future. You, you outlined, you know, the, the sort of the, 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 the journey from contract driven to standard driven that now we've got platforms. Do you have any sense, is there a move beyond platforms? Is, is what, could, what could trump platforms what what you know what strategic move might might come next yeah it's it's uh it's it's something that this is a question that's occupying all of my uh, fascination right now because um, be. yeah because I, I i see i see that it's happening uh you know when i uh, started looking at platforms i initially looked at value creation uh, and and how business models were changing then i ended up looking at how platforms were exploiting the ecosystem and now what's What's really capturing my fancy is uh, the potential for decentralized technologies to create an alternative mechanism to orchestrate ecosystems. And, um, you know, I would say that that shift is more than just a shift from platforms to protocols. A lot of those on the technology side of things um, who, who are working on Web3 from a technology perspective, they see this as a shift from platforms to protocols. It's, it's a lot more than that. The way I see it is in the pipeline world, we used vertical integration as a way to compete. Companies used to compete because of uh, by owning more of the value chain through vertical integration. That did not necessarily mean that they were the best at every activity in the value chain. What digital technologies did was they unbundled these vertically integrated corporations so that any company could now focus on just one activity and you could just have one API and still be a very you know, powerful company. Look at a company like Twilio, for instance, doing just cloud communications. So uh, what these did was they unbundled vertically integrated corporations. But then what platforms did, uh, digital platforms, they rebundled these, uh, this highly unbundled value chain by creating a bottleneck over the market. So every, you know, every, player in the market, no longer vertically integrated, focused on a specific activity, could now be rebundled around a platform. And that's what uh, a, a, lo a lot of these platform companies did. So in a way, platform companies grew and uh, grew in scale and power because they combined infrastructure and governance at market-wide scale by providing you know, infrastructure for the entire market and govern setting up the rules for transaction across the entire market. What's happening with Web3, I believe, is that this infrastructure and governance is getting unbundled. So you can have some element of governance, like an Ethereum, or uh, uh, I, I work with a protocol called Boson Protocol, which is setting up uh, the, the standards for future, future commerce in a decentralized world. And so you can set up a lot of your uh, governance within the protocol, but then you allow market infrastructure to be created by external third parties. Think of it as a bit like Hollywood. Hollywood does not have a single platform connecting actors to studios. Hollywood relies on a market of competitive agents. Agents compete with each other to get access to the best talent and they use their relationships with the studios to get that, that talent to, uh, you know, get, get new opportunities for the talent. What I believe we're going to is a similar kind of a model where there'll be protocols that will define how the market should work but who represents the seller, who represents the buyer, who represents producers and consumers would be highly decentralized. And so it will be more of this Hollywood kind of an agent-based economy with all agents being orchestrated through a common protocol. It's, it's still some ways out, 
Um, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that need to come in place, especially new kinds of funding mechanisms. Because what we often don't realize with technology is that new technological shifts give rise to new business models only when we have new sustainable ways of funding those business models. And the previous generation of platforms were built on the venture capital model. If we move to a decentralized model, we need to have something different from venture capital because you're not going to get 5x, 10x returns in a decentralized world. So that's where I, I believe some level of innovation needs to happen before we see this next generation of platforms coming up. There's an, there's an interesting point from uh, somebody on LinkedIn saying, created shared value by combining competencies, service and products in cross-company com value chains, maybe the birth of an on-demand company. So I suppose yeah, that, 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 that could be the counter to platforms. I, I think we're already seeing that happen in different ways. Uh, we are seeing on-demand workforces for sure. Uh, we moved, you know, we started with freelancers and now we, we're moving to on-demand workforce where you don't just have uh, a full-time employee versus a freelancer. You have different levels of talent pools, which you can organize at different levels of engagement. And so you, you can get on-demand workforce to work on really complex projects, which was not possible five years back. So in a similar way, we could end up seeing on-demand companies as well, where you could define the logic of value creation and assemble teams and structures and assets to uh, run that um, on an on-demand basis where using the reputation system, you could determine who performs a certain part of that value chain and who gets fired or what level of metrics do they need to meet to continue to be part of this on-demand company. So I, I feel that as coordination technologies improve, that's absolutely likely to happen. What, what you'll really see is that the early phase of the platform economy uh, till the mid 2010s was really focused on taking simple transactions and executing them at scale. So it was simple marketplace transactions. Uh, you know, a, a car is a car on Uber. It's the so finding the nearest car is a simple transaction, and Uber operates that at scale. What we're seeing now is as we see platforms organize the rest of the value chain, especially further up, we need more than transactions. We need complex coordination. If you want to move a shipment from point A to point B. Uh, you need to coordinate warehouses, shipping companies, ports, brokers, agents. It's more complex than a car moving from point A to point B on Uber. So the more we start seeing these coordination technologies improve, the more likely we are to get to a place where we see that on-demand company come up. Well, I, I meant to ask you earlier, Anton had a question. We're, we're possibly going a little bit back, but, it, but I think it's a, it's a good question. I mean, to summarize... What antitrust issues do you see in relation to e ecosystems? And, and is antitrust even you know, going to be an effective sort of language anymore? Because it, obviously it's the, it's the language of big government. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. I mean, um, that, that is where um, I, I feel the current lens or view that we have on antitrust is, get, gets a little limited because it's built fundamentally on a pipeline world. It's built on supply side monopolistic access. It's built on price-based extraction on the consumer side. It does not account for data-based using that to create new products and create monopolistic control. It does not account for the fact that you don't need to own the assets in order to control them. So there are, there are some, uh, you know, some challenges with using the current antitrust lens as is. Um, this is where I, I believe that certain additional lenses around, um, and, and th this may, uh, again, require us to rewrite how we, how we see regulation, but uh, lenses that are important today, even more so, are lenses around exploitation versus empowerment. In, in an ecosystem, is a player empowering other players or is it exploiting players and extracting beyond what is required to give value back to the ecosystem? Some of these lenses uh, are, are going to be more important as we move forward, um, because as I mentioned, platforms succeed or platforms repeatedly use this narrative that they're actually empowering the ecosystem there. And that is why users have the choice and yet they're staying back with them. Merchants have the choice, yet they're staying back with them because they must be doing something right. So having a clear lens on identifying, you know, when is the platform ceding to empower and moving to exploitation becomes important. I'll give a couple of examples over here. Um, if you think of, the future of work, right? What we've seen with platforms is that the more more commoditized the uh, you know a worker's skills are, and the less of a learning element the worker's skills have, 
the more a platform tends to exploit. So if you if you think of uh, uh, ride hailing or delivery companies, these are low skill jobs uh, where suppliers of those skills are easily replaceable. And so these suppliers of skills or these workers are not really empowered. They are exploited uh, to, to ensure that um, you have the most efficient market possible. You reduce the prices. You, uh, you know, some of these platforms do not provide enough information to the supplier before they can get onto a ride, etc. On the other hand, if you look at high, highly skilled work, platforms over there empower the user because those users are more difficult to get ho uh, a hold of, and those users also improve uh, through learning. And because they improve through learning. They, they can scale up on a reputation system and deliver increasing amounts of value back in the ecosystem. And so those are, you know, that's a very simple lens to kind of start seeing that based on the type of skill, because a certain skill is getting commoditized in this new economy, it's more likely to be exploited versus skills which are not getting commoditized, which have a huge learning element. That is where platforms start empowering. So, you know, I, I believe that in an ecosystem when the entire premise is around facilitating the ecosystem, the lens of are you exploiting or are you empowering is an important lens to look at in addition to the you know the antitrust lens that we have today. Sangeet, uh, we're, we're out of time. Uh, many thanks for joining us today. If people want to find out more about your work, where, where's the best place to look? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for this uh, time, Stuart and Des. Uh, to, to know more about my work, you could uh, visit my website, platformthinkinglabs.com. Um, and I also run a newsletter called platforms.substack.com uh, where I share my latest thinking on this topic. Brilliant. And obviously people can uh, rush out and buy your books immediately as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you very much uh, for joining us, Sangeet. I think it's a really um, in interesting and multifaceted uh, discussion about the platforms and their role and the role of governments is, is eye-opening, really, I think. Uh, so thank you very much, Sangeet, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we're taking a, a break for a, for a little while now and focusing on the Thinkers 50 Gala on the November the 15th and 16th, uh, so three weeks away. We really hope you can join us. If you want any more information, check out thinkers50.com. So thank you, Sangeet, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much.